My name is uh, Dennis Quinn. I'm a professor of English at the University of Kansas. And with me today uh, and throughout these lectures will be uh, Professor Senior, John Senior, of the Classics Department at the University of Kansas. <clears throat> Mr. Senior and I and another colleague uh, about really about 14 or 15 years ago uh, began teaching a course which was called, or a sequence of courses that was called the Integrated Humanities Program. And in it, we, uh, we read and uh, talked about the great books of Western civilization. It was uh, what is called a great books program, although uh, quite different from typical great books programs of uh, the kind that started at Chicago University. But it began <clears throat> with the uh, with Greek authors, and that's what we intend to do here. We'll begin by uh, reading Homer, and we will proceed to uh, read Plato and uh, some Greek, other Greek authors, and then. Uh, we'll go on to read Latin authors and medieval authors and modern authors, uh, reading books that are uh, of various kinds, uh, many of them uh, poetry, uh, some of them uh, philosophical books, some of them historical or biographical books, uh, books of various kinds. Father uh, Randall Payne has asked us to give these lectures for uh, seminarians or for uh, young men who are uh, about to enter the seminary, as I understand it. They're rather uh, preliminary courses or preliminary uh, lectures for those considering entering the uh, seminary. And this first lecture is going to be uh, devoted to talking about the whole uh, program, that is, what it is that we set out to do. Uh, uh, Father Payne uh, was in this program uh, many years ago when it first started. He completed the whole uh, four-semester sequence and went on to uh, finish college and uh, later uh, to enter uh, the order. At his uh, request, we're going to attempt to cover uh, at least most of the material that we covered in the Integrated Humanities uh, in a series of lectures, just Mr. Senior and I. So uh, next time, at the, in the next lecture, we will start our uh, lectures on Homer. And in this, uh, in, these, in this particular lecture, we're going to talk about, try to explain uh, what our approach to this subject is and why we approach it in the way that we do and why this material is important. It might seem uh, to some rather strange uh, to start off uh, uh, talking to seminarians about uh, books which are, uh, for the most part, uh, well, the first two semesters, they're all pagan books. There are, there are no Christian authors at all that we talk about until the third semester when we start talking about the Bible. Uh, and it's uh, by way of explaining that that we, uh, that we intend to, uh, to start today. In some ways, we're disobeying the rule uh, of our subject. Uh, one of the most famous phrases having to do with poetry is a Latin phrase uh, applied to all narrative, but especially to Homer and the epic, that is that it should begin in medias race. It should begin in the middle of things. And uh, today, for some reason, uh, we're more uh, awkwardly uh, applying the scholastic method where uh, we're, we're writing a kind of preface. Uh, uh, trying to point out beforehand what it is that we're going to do uh, and to some extent the order in which it's going to be done. Uh, I suppose uh, the reason why we're doing this is that uh, we are speaking to, to students 
who are most likely to have been introduced to uh, the scholastic method or, uh, uh, e either in the seminary itself or uh, in the various studies that they've taken uh, already in school and in college. Uh, we thought quite a bit about this uh, before attempting uh, this tape today. Uh, should we just simply plunge into a passage and stop talking about Homer and fill these things in as we go along, or would, would it be better to say, oh, wait a minute, um, uh, we don't want to lose our audience here. Uh, you might not understand what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, if we're going to use this scholastic method, we of course then have to talk about what always comes absolutely first. That is, we have to begin at the beginning. Yeah, and that's, that's the end. Yeah. Uh, that is the purpose uh, or the, the, the final cause of it. That is, uh, what is, uh, what is the, uh, uh, the, the end, uh, uh, the bullseye uh, at which we're shooting here? We probably will not proceed. We won't, won't continue in this mode of uh, discourse, as we will explain to you. Uh, we will uh, turn to a more poetic uh, mode of, uh, of discourse and a more uh, poetic approach to the material as soon as we uh, really embark on Homer himself. The, uh, uh, the first uh, problem, uh, I suppose it's a, it's a problem, it can be solved. Uh, the, uh, it's not a mystery, it's, 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 a, it's a difficulty, but it's a difficulty that, uh, uh, that, that can be overcome, but it's a pretty, it's pretty difficult difficulty. Uh, in teaching uh, is, the, uh, is the problem of, of all rhetoricians. That is, uh, you do have to say something to a particular audience. Uh, and if you just follow the order of the subject, leave the audience out, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a disaster. And uh, we, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have the advantage that we usually have as teachers of seeing uh, our students uh, right in front of us. Uh, well, one of the things that uh, uh, teachers in the poetic mode uh, that we follow do uh, is watch uh, the faces, uh, the eyes uh, uh, of the students. Uh, uh, you, you can, the teacher can, can tell whether or not someone's listening to him, uh, uh, whether he's uh, following uh, what's being said. Uh, that's rather uh, impossible here on the tape. So we we have to imagine uh, someone sitting uh, and listening to us here, and uh, we're not at all sure whether uh, what we say uh, will be taken seriously. Uh, there are so many uh, difficulties that we face here. One of them is the uh, preeminence of the scholastic method itself. That is, uh, most students in seminaries have already ascended uh, to the, uh, the notion that uh, the best way to treat a subject is systematically. Uh, that is, in a, in a philosophical way, in a scientific way. Uh, you, uh, you, you, you talk about the, the end, and then you back off and talk about the means that are proportioned to the end. Uh, well, we have to combat that to some extent, because <clears throat> one of the things that we want to say is that the scholastic method is uh, appropriate to a seminary, uh, but it presupposes uh, another kind of education first. And what we've discovered is that that kind of education has been lost, and that seminarians are uh, exposed to a scholastic method without the prerequisites. I guess it comes down to that. Well, we have found over the years in simply teaching uh, college students here at the University of Kansas that uh, they too have had a kind of scholastic uh, uh, preparation, uh, not in the, in the strict sense of the word scholastic with a capital S, but uh, the, uh, the secular schools have all adopted a scientific method of, uh, of approaching all subjects. Uh, now we, we uh, think that the, uh, the scientific method of approaching physics is, is, of course, the proper method of approaching physics. But once again, uh, there is uh, a presupposition that there is some other kind of knowledge that they are building on. But that presupposition is no longer justified, we have found. 
Uh, we could say that uh, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, a student coming to college, a student entering a seminar, uh, would have had these prerequisites uh, that, that we would call them that have all been learned in a different way and that they were ready to begin uh, with a scholastic method, whether with a large S or a small S, or a scientific method, we would say. But that, that we find is no longer true. And therefore, we, we feel we have to start somewhere else. Well, that's, that's the first difficulty, I think, that we want to face uh, today. Uh, there's another difficulty uh, having to do uh, uh, more strictly with the church, although, again, I think you, you could apply the same thing in the, the secular education, too, uh, in a way. And that is the problem of authority. Uh, that is, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the church is, is, an, is an authority and teaches as having that authority, that is, Christ gave to the church an authority uh, in uh, in teaching doctrine, and uh, Catholics uh, uh, students uh, develop uh, almost throughout their lives uh, a, a false idea of authority. Uh, that is, that um, uh, it's the only thing that there is. Uh, the, the, the two and two is four only because uh, a teacher told you uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, that you, you accept everything that you learn on the authority of the teacher or on the authority of the book that the teacher is teaching. Well, it's exactly the same, uh, especially in the sciences and mathematics. The example from mathematics is a good choice because in the, in the secular school, once again, uh, science is uh, the most dogmatically taught of all the subjects. Uh, a uh, uh, science teacher is one who has mastered the subject of science. The textbook gives you all of the answers uh, to all the questions. It shows you the method that you are to follow. It starts, if you take biology, they start you off with the cell and the parts of the cell, and they simply teach you dogmatically that that's what it is. And there is, uh, it is all laid down authoritatively. How those things uh, were arrived at, you are not told. Uh, you're given really, in effect, you're given conclusions. And you simply take them as being absolutely true. Uh, it's, that is not so true in other subjects. Uh, although, uh, still, uh, despite uh, a greater degree of relativity in teaching of other subjects, social sciences and the humanities and so forth, still the authority of the teacher is preeminent. In well, the, the, the relativity itself becomes the dogma. That's yeah. the only difference, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but the teacher certainly teaches it. And there, <clears throat> there, uh, there's a canon of standard literary texts, for example, in, in English classes. Uh, and uh, all the students have to read those books and have to uh, assent to the to the to the truth of those books and and assent to the uh, to the excellence of them. Uh, now, uh, uh, the, the church uh, uh, has commanded, for example, uh, the, uh, the the theology of Saint Thomas to be taught uh, in all of its schools as the uh, as the measure uh, of whatever else uh, might be learned. Uh, you can take a, a simple example. Uh, uh, the, the famous five proofs for the existence of God. Now, the five proofs that St. Thomas presents are not <coughs> true because he presents them, nor are they true because the church said that St. Thomas was the authority in those matters. They are true because they're true in themselves. And uh, St. Thomas teaches them because he saw that they were true. And the church confirms that truth. Uh, but the reason why they are true is that they are true. They begin, for example, with statements like, something moves. Now, we're supposed to stop and consider that. I mean, is that true? That something moves. Uh, that's not to be taken on authority. What is that to be taken on? Well, that, that's, uh, that's an obvious fact. That's to be taken on fact. Uh, and facts have got to be seen 
and heard. And that is, we, we, we arrive at facts through the senses and through experience. Now, I know parenthetically that all kinds of horrible heresies have been promulgated uh, throughout the history of the church, but especially recently in the name of experience. And Lord knows we're, we're not going to, to advocate varieties of religious experience or varieties of philosophic experience. We're not, we're not talking about that. Usually when people use the word experience in that sense, they mean emotions, I think, or enthusiasm or something like that. But we're talking about the, the, the experience of sight, for example. That is the sense that, that you, can, you can see something move. You, you don't take that on authority. Now, if something moves, the, we then say, well, what is the cause of that motion? Because, because movement is not something given. It, it's a consequence. It's a, it's, a, it's a result of something. Why does that thing move? What caused it to move? And so we get you know, into, into the, the, the chain of reasoning that leads back to, uh, to God as the cause of all motion. But, but that proof, the point I'm trying to make here, is not something to be taken on authority. It's something that has to begin with observation. Now, these uh, pursuits uh, in elementary and uh, 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 intermediate uh, education, which are prerequisite to a scholastic education, these pursuits are sometimes called frivolous. Uh, they, they're, they're not serious. Uh, uh, people say, "Well, I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to train my senses. Uh, I, I can see for myself. Any darn fool can see. Look, uh, uh, there goes a bird. Something moves. Let's get on with the proof." Yeah, they say I used the word preliminary a little bit while ago, and and uh, people are, especially now, uh, people. Uh, I say. People, uh, students, uh, good students, and uh, especially good students, and uh, teachers themselves are inclined to say, "Well, let's skip the preliminaries." Now, who needs the preliminaries? We, you know, they're they're trivial, uh, they're obvious, uh, such as the the, the idea like that obvious something facts. moves. And they're <laughs> obvious, and therefore uh, we can skip those. We don't need to to stop uh, to consider those things. Uh, we can go on to more advanced things immediately and skip the preliminaries. That's that's a kind of phrase. You say, well, let's skip the preliminaries. Let's get down to the to what's really important, meaning that the preliminaries are not important. That they the, can the, be omitted. That the obvious isn't important, for yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, I, I suppose we could we could make up a little slogan for our for our course and say that uh, really it's a course in the obvious. Uh, we uh, we pay strict attention to the obvious. And uh, uh, strange as it may seem, or paradoxical uh, as it is, uh, the uh, the obvious is the least obvious thing in the world. It's the one thing that you are are most inclined to overlook. Plain as the nose on your face, but you don't see your nose. Uh, you, it's not so plain. Uh, we, 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 we tend to notice everything else. Yeah, Jacques uh, Maritain, uh, to, to cite another uh, scholastic philosopher, uh, makes makes a very very big point out of this. He he uses the example of the purloined letter in his book on the introduction to metaphysics. I remember he has a long comparison of being to and and all of the first principles of philosophy. He compares them to the purloined letter. You know, the purloined letter is that letter in the uh, in, in Edgar Allan Poe that's placed uh, in plain sight uh, so that it will not be found. It's put in the most obvious place, and it's overlooked by the detectives. They that, don't. That's the best way to hide something. That's is, the way to hide it. He wants to hide this letter so nobody will find it when the police come and search the place. So he puts it right out on the mantelpiece. And they, they miss it. And, and, and Maritain says, uh, that's the case with being. Take something like being. He said, well, people say, well, being is odd. Everything is. Everything exists. We can see that. Uh, you don't need to point that out. And yet he says, well, that's, that's all metaphysics is about, is being. And if you don't see what being is, well, you can't possibly... Uh, if, if you don't see what this particular object is, this cow exists, 
then it, you're not even, you can't possibly ever achieve uh, the very difficult science of metaphysics. And uh, what, what happens uh, is that the overwhelming majority of students uh, in this generation and in the immediate preceding ones, I'd say this has been going on for <clears throat> for almost a century now, uh, with what we call the modern world or the industrialized world, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the school turned into a kind of factory, turned into a kind of machine uh, where study has become uh, the manipulation of, uh, of things, uh, the methodized and so forth. Uh, in, in, in this modern world that we live in, uh, students are put into scholastic studies without these prerequisites. And what happens? Well, uh, they, uh, they, they learn a kind of machine metaphysics or a kind of machine theology. That is, they memorize questions and answers on the authority of the teacher. If it's, if it's a secular school, it'll be on some secular authority, and they'll come out, uh, whatever it is, uh, spouting the propositions of, of Karl Marx or, or Sigmund Freud. Or Thomas Aquinas. Or, 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 but in the Catholic education, <clears throat> it turns out to be Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, but it's not a real education. No, I know. When I, when I was going to school, this is a long time ago now, I, I was in the Army and, uh, just after World War II and got out of the Army about 19... Oh, about 1948, and started in a Catholic college where there was a, uh, a scholastic uh, uh, education. And um, I remember once particularly, uh, I was I was uh, not a Catholic at the time, but I took uh, courses in metaphysics in uh, in my freshman year. I took a course in metaphysics with a textbook in Thomistic metaphysics and a textbook. In, in psychology, to mystic psychology. And I remember once being in a class, actually there was a great books class there, and we were reading John Locke and, and some things from Thomas Aquinas, and there were some students in there who were advanced uh, uh, philosophy students. And I remember, I was very young, and I, I didn't really know very much about anything, uh, none of us did, but I know that I was a very uh, I, I, I had a very bad impression of these of these advanced philosophy students. Whatever question you brought up, they had the answer. In, it was all in a slogan. It was all in a phrase, and it was right out of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, they had the answer to every single question. You couldn't. It was undiscussable. Uh, you were supposed to think about the book you were reading, but the minute a question was raised, they settled it and finished it off forever. And uh, they they could not really talk about it. Uh, it. It turned out they could never really discuss or, or consider the question at all because they they had it all uh, summed up in a in a formula. Uh, and, and and that type goes on uh, into more advanced studies. Uh, if, if he doesn't know the answer, he looks it up. That's, yeah. the, that's the next yeah, one. They run right home and they get the index of, uh, of Thomas Aquinas and they look it up in the index and they find the question and then they, they say, aha, there, there it is. It, it turns a study into, into a dictionary. It turns uh, all learning in, into uh, uh, a, uh, an index or concordance to the collected works of somebody or other. It's either going to be St. Thomas or it's going to be somebody else. Uh, and that is not... Uh, of course, what St. Thomas himself does, uh, and it's not what the church uh, intends, it's not what Christ did, and it's not what God, uh, 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 the Father, did uh, in creating the world. Uh, that is, uh, 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 things are, are not true uh, be, because uh, God uh, decided that it would go this way and not that way, uh, God himself uh, can't uh, affirm a contradiction. That is, the freedom uh, uh, does not have to do with error. It has to do only with truth. Uh, the reason why things are true is that that's the way they are. That, that's the true thing. Two and two is four, not because God affirmed 
that two and two is four. Uh, God can't change his mind about It's because that. The, the way God is himself, God is, is, is a certain way. He, he, and therefore, <laughs> there's no other way that two and two can be except his, for. His, his, his action uh, follows his, his being. Uh, and and in, his, in his action of creation, uh, what he creates follows from his own, his own being, his own existence, from the way that he is. Uh, and uh, he can't change his mind. I know there really is a state of mind, especially among <clears throat> conservative Catholics, that is today among wild uh, and, and, uh, and heretical Catholics, uh, you, you'll hear almost anything said, but among the more conservative Catholics, you frequently get that idea that things are true because the church says they are. That is, when, 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 when the creed is recited, why do you, why do you believe the creed? Well, because the church teaches it. Well, well, no. Uh, the church teaches it because that is what we believe. We 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 believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Uh, that's what we believe, and we believe those things that the Catholic Church believes and teaches. Uh, if if you if you pursue uh, this argument uh, to the bitter end, uh, you 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 could see that uh, it would be really a denial of the authority of God uh, to put authority in anything else. That is, all authority uh, derives from God himself. And uh, when we study the book of nature, when we look out the window here and we see a blue sky and, and a green uh, woods, <clears throat> that is... Uh, True. I don't have to turn uh, uh, to 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 the church to have that uh, affirmed. Uh, in in fact, the teaching of the church is based upon those distinctions that I can see the blue and I can see the green and I can see that the sky is not the same thing as the trees. Well, this, this uh, one of the doctrines mm -hmm. of Saint Thomas Aquinas is that uh, that all knowledge comes ultimately from the senses. It's a very simple doctrine, and, and, and it seems, again, uh, very obvious, but it, it's, it's not so obvious. It's, and, it, and it's not true because he said and it. it. But it's not true because he said it. It's, it's because it's the way it is. He, he said it because it's true. Yeah. And, he, and he, uh, he says that himself over and over again, that he, he doesn't want anyone to take what he says or anyone else says uh, as true because they said it. Now, of course, it, it is true that if, uh, if Aristotle or, or St. Thomas has said something, uh, I, I pay attention. If I, if I read something that some, uh, some journalist has said in a newspaper or some uh, so-called modern theologian has said, well, I, I, uh, I very often take it with a grain of salt. I say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't waste my time listening to somebody like that or thinking about what somebody like that has said. Now, uh, whereas if, if Aristotle said it, I'm, I'm going to look at it very seriously or, or uh, some, someone else. Authority does have that kind of a role, but that's to be distinguished very carefully from the role of, of its being true because they said it. Yes, again, we, we, we're not uh, attacking authority and we're not attacking St. Thomas and Aristotle. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you do have to have a certain confidence in your teachers in order to learn anything. You do have to listen, and you have to withhold your criticism. We certainly don't want to stimulate some kind of thing called thinking for oneself. I think that gets you in trouble. Uh, but what we, we are saying is that when you follow uh, the teaching of a master, you have to follow it. That's the point. You have to be attentive to what's being said. And if the teacher, the master, the, whether it's St. Thomas or Aristotle, or whoever it is that you're following, if that teacher or that master says, now consider this, you have to consider it. You don't just simply write it down in your notebook. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've always attacked in students, in our course now, we're not talking about a, a course in in, 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 in some other study, but in our course, we've always attacked the taking of notes because it's an outward sign of this interior uh, indisposition that we're talking about. 
That is, uh, a student who has been brought up on methodical teaching. Everything is learned by method. And at the same time, uh, follows authority. A student who has been brought up on those, in those two ways together is most likely uh, to be a, a note taker. Uh, the, the minute uh, the teacher comes into class, he's got his pencil sharp and his notebook out, and he waits, of course, for what? Well, he waits for point Roman numeral one, a capital A, uh, little one. You know, he, he, he wants to get that outline down with first things first, and of course he wants to write down whatever it is the teacher says because he knows that that has to be memorized and that that will appear on the test and that that is the whole purpose of education. Now, that, that's, that's false. It's not education at all. It's not education at all. Um, I think anybody who has ever done that, and everybody has, well, I have, uh, Mr. Senior has, I'm sure we have all uh, diligently taken notes in college because that was what you were taught to do. It's the only way to pass the test. It's the only way you can pass the test. You know that that material is going to appear on the test. And then what you do is you, you really pay no attention to what is being said beyond uh, those points. Uh, you soon develop a certain kind of knack for being able to tell what's going to be on the test and what isn't going to be on the test. And if it isn't going to be on the test, you, uh, you look out the window and let your mind sort of wander until uh, you, you vaguely hear perhaps the, uh, the teacher coming back to the outline again. Then you get out your pen and you, then you put down the, the essential notes. Well, it, it really converts experience into an outline, uh, as if the outline were more important than the experience. Uh, as if the, the outline of the truth were more important than the truth. And it, it's, it's not education in, in any sense, really. Uh, that is, as I say, I've done that and you've done that. And uh, you realize you fill up all of those notebooks during your college education or your high school education. Uh, and uh, some people even keep them <clears throat> with the idea that they'll be useful sometime or another. And you look at all those notes, and maybe someday you even go back and you open them up and you, you read those notes, and you realize that you didn't learn any of that at all. You don't remember any of that. You've got dates and names and uh, names of movements and schools and treaties and all sorts of things written in there that at one time you memorized to put down on a test. Uh, you, you came in, you took the test, uh, you put the things faithfully down on the test, and then you forgot them. And you forgot them permanently. Uh, those are things mostly that you will not remember at all. Well, we're talking about difficulties, which is what prefaces are supposed to do, aren't they? They're supposed to um, uh, get rid of obstacles to the, uh, uh, to the study. Uh, of course, they're also supposed to uh, be pleasant and, and uh, and they're supposed to facilitate the subject. I'm not so sure that what we're saying is pleasant. It may very well uh, go against the grain. Uh, there may very well be uh, uplifted eyebrows at this point. Because we've talked about these difficulties. One, that method itself is not appropriate to the kind of education, to the stage of, of learning that we're talking about in this course. Method may very well be appropriate to certain studies in science or certain kinds of science. And the scholastic method may be appropriate to a certain kind of theological study. But it, method of any kind, not the scholastic method, method of any kind is not appropriate to what we're going to talk about. And so we look upon method itself as an obstacle. And uh, that may come uh, uh, as something of a, of a, of a shock uh, uh, to people. And uh, although we all say we like to be shocked, we don't. Uh, that is another way of putting it is it may be outside the margins of our mind. When someone says something like that, we tend to say, well, that's ridiculous. I'm, not, I'm just not going to take that seriously. The only way to learn anything is to, is to find the proper method. And here are these fellows saying, well, we don't believe in any method at all 
in order to learn the particular thing that we want to learn. Well, if that's true, then we would eliminate it. It's not learning. It's not it's something else. It may be fun. It may be games. It may be, uh, it, it may be all sorts of things, but that's not what learning is. In other words, learning is identified with method. And when someone attacks method, uh, it, it, it's just simply thrown out. Now, we're, we're speaking from long experience of this. We know that although at first certain students may very well look upon us as authorities because we've been introduced by someone else in authority, uh, they may sit and patiently try to follow what we say. There's a point when their mind just simply begins to wander. What? Not take notes? Then what are we to do? Well, if we're not going to take notes, then what are we going to do? I mean, we're just going to sit here and listen to a rambling kind of a, uh, a conversation uh, that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Well, let's back up and back up and be a little scholastic. Okay, we attack method, and then we went on to attack authority. Now we're not attacking either method or authority in themselves, but we are uh, 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 trying to open uh, the student up uh, to. Uh, uh, learning things that need neither method nor authority. In fact, uh, method and authority are impediments because they have to do with the obvious, something that you can only see for yourself. And if an authority comes along uh, and tells you that you are to memorize this obvious fact, then you see to you it isn't any longer obvious. The, the authority has stepped in between you and the observance of the thing itself. What does obvious mean? It's a Latin word. It means what you bump into on the way. Ob, as in obstacle, you know, the, the, the prefix or the preposition in Latin, ob, ob, as an object. An object is something thrown in your way. Well, uh, the obvious, the word via, just means the road we're on. We're on the way. We're on a, a pilgrimage uh, to uh, to the beatific vision. We're on, we're, all, we're all on a pilgrimage to heaven, and there are certain things that are obvious. That is, they're 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 thrown up right in front of us as plain facts. Now, if we don't see those plain facts, we're never going to go along the way. And if somebody walks along with you and says, "Now, I want you to." memorize this and I want you to follow this argument, then you're not going to be seeing the fact for yourself. I don't know, sometimes uh, one wonders whether the best education wouldn't be you know, no education at all, just throw students into a situation where they have to look uh, at the blue of the sky and the, uh, the uh, uh, green of the trees. Uh, there are uh, educators who have gone that far and said, uh, why don't we, at this stage of education, uh, which is uh, elementary, why don't we just uh, turn kids loose? I suppose Rousseau had, had something of that notion. Uh, 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 just just let the kid run loose in the, in, in the fields, and uh, he'll learn for himself. Yeah, well, uh, Rousseau was, was wrong in a, in a great many ways, especially about education. He was wrong, and he's been followed, and he's misled a lot of people. But... On the other hand, he was uh, reacting uh, against a, a century in which uh, the scientific method had come to absolutely dominate all education. And nobody ever walked into a field and looked at anything. As in all era, there's a truth in his era. I mean, he, he, the era wouldn't exist if there weren't a truth. And he was certainly right about that. That, that is, that, that, that uh, methodical education was derived largely from Descartes, but, but everybody else. Uh, uh, the, the whole uh, of, of, the, of the century uh, was a century where method had strangled experience. You see, if, uh, if, you, uh, if you learn only about frogs uh, by uh, reading about the frog and the, the anatomy of the frog in a textbook, and then going to the laboratory and anatomizing a, uh, a, a frog that's been uh, pickled, uh, and you have never really seen a living frog out there in nature, uh, then there's going to be something fatally wrong with your education. Uh, that's 
just as an example, but the, but the fact is that we that almost everything that is learned in school now is learned by this textbook uh, and laboratory method. That is, we get instruments, we get microscopes, and we look at the thing under the microscope, uh, but we've never seen the thing macroscopically uh, for ourselves uh, without the aid of this instrument. Uh, we often give it the example of, uh, of looking at the stars. Uh, it turns out that, uh, for example, at the, at the University of Kansas, and I'm sure this is a pattern all over the country, there was for years a course called observational astronomy, where uh, the first thing that students did was to, be, to go outside on a, on a dark night, to be taken out uh, to where the lights of the city wouldn't interfere, and the uh, the professor gave a lecture on the on the planets, right? and then he gave a lecture on the constellation. Now, well, he didn't give a lecture; he just pointed to them. He said, "Well, there you see is uh, Cassiopeia. There, uh, look look at that." And he would point out the stars and the planets and the phases of the moon, and to get people to just look at that. That, by the way, here at the University of Kansas, was a very very popular course. Students took that course by the hundreds. Well, the man who taught it, who was a very popular teacher and a very good teacher, died, or he retired. And what happened was that that course was then eliminated. There is no course in observational astronomy at this big state university, prestigious state university. There is no course in observational astronomy. I doubt if you can find, find one anywhere. There's a course in introduction to astronomy, well, but it's, it's no longer this observational. Is, it's right? astrophysics. Sure. Now what you learn is astrophysics. You see, you skip the obvious. You skip the phases of the moon. In other words, you'll have students who know all about or seem to know all about uh, the methods of studying uh, stars that are so remote that they cannot be seen by even the most powerful telescope. Uh, they'll know all about the methodology of astronomy, and yet if you say to them, uh, well, uh, could, you, could you just explain to me the phases of the moon, they, they can't do that at all. Uh, they've never really looked at the moon. They know nothing about these things that are so close to us. The obvious is something that's very close to us, and really the, uh, the, uh, the moon is very, very close to us. It's the astral body that's closest to us, and we can look at it with our own eyes, and we can see those phases of the moon. Uh, we can look at the, at, the, uh, at the planets, and we can notice their, where they are, because in a way they are, they are obvious. But the, the course in astrophysics skips <clears throat> all of that or deals with it as quickly as it possibly can so that it can get into outer space where nothing is obvious at all. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't, isn't what we've been saying true? That, that's what we'd like you to consider uh, in your own life, in your own experience. That is, I, I wonder, that is, if you ask yourself, uh, how many of you uh, can identify uh, the planets. Well, can you identify the moon, <laughs> for example? <laughs> can you identify the, Do you know right now, sitting where you are, right now, did you notice uh, uh, what in what phase the moon was last night? Uh, is it an old moon, a new moon? Uh, do you know, or are you really sure what the new moon is and what the old moon is? I went out last night and was rather terrified of the moon. I, I didn't know what it was. Uh, uh, I, um, I really thought, well, uh, it's a flying saucer. Last time I've seen a flying saucer. Or there's some terrible thing. We're in apocalyptic times now, and there's some terrible thing that's happening in the sky because that moon's hanging so far over the uh, west horizon. Yes. It was yes. down in the trees. It, it, it looked like a fire of some sort. In the, yeah. and, I, and as I walked, it was uh, interrupted uh, by the trees, the, the branches of the trees. So it looked sort of like a jagged thing burning there. And I, I was really uh, stopped for a moment uh, until I said, oh, oh, that's the moon. <laughs> <laughs> that's the moon. Yeah. I, I'm so glad uh, that, I, that I know what the, what the, moon, what the moon is. But, uh, well, we're into a third thing here, too, I think. Uh, we're against method and we're against authority and we're against uh, speed. Mr. Quinn has referred 
uh, a few times already to that idea of let's skip, let's skip the preliminaries. Why? Well, because we want to get on as fast as we can to the more important things. Uh, why don't we speed up education? Why waste time? One of the things that might be occurring to some of our listeners right now is that how many minutes have gone by and what have we said? Uh, how much of what we said uh, have we repeated over and over? I remember having a, a smart students in class who <clears throat> sometimes very politely come up at the end of the class and say, you know, I kind of like what you're saying, but gee, you know, I I'm too smart for this class. You must be talking to a bunch of dummies. Uh, I'm an honor student. Uh, I'm a bright fellow. I have a high IQ. I, I got what you said the first time you said it, and uh, I could have, uh, you know, walked out of class and and I come back 15 minutes later and you're still saying the same thing. Well, what I've always said to students like that is, well, if, the fact that you're saying that means that you, you didn't hear us at all. Uh, because there's something about obvious facts like the moon. What's the matter with stopping? I mean, why should we go on to something else? Um, well, what's the matter with the sky that we should say, all right, it's blue. No, let's go on. All right, the trees are green. Let's go on to something red, yeah. purple. And, and tonight you can uh, you can go uh, duck out the front door and you can look up and you say, yep, yep the moon is no, I've got that. I got that. Okay, close the door, come back in, say, now, now I know what phase the moon is. And I'm going to do that every night. I'm going to spend uh, two seconds every night checking out to see what phase of the moon. Then I'll know. Say well, but that isn't. Uh, you're not. You're not looking at the moon at all. What's the purpose of an obvious fact? <clears throat> well, here we are now with the great philosophers. Because isn't this what Aristotle says about education? Uh, in in the last book of the of the Politics, one of the great books uh, by the by the great philosopher, whom Saint Thomas says is the Prince of philosophers and the greatest of them all. And the church has, has ratified that, so we can speak here with authority. Uh, St. Thomas says, uh, and, and Aristotle says, uh, in, in order to talk about education, they have to be thought. Uh, you have to see those with the minds on. But, but one of the, of, the, of, the, of the principles is this distinction between means and ends. We, we see uh, that uh, we do certain things in order to arrive at certain ends. And in our experience, we discover that there are useful things, and then there are what we call fruitful things. Uh, we, we, can, we, can, we can use those two terms, uh, uh, useful and, and fruitful. Now, what about these obvious facts, like a crescent moon or like this particular sky, are they useful? Uh, that is, is the purpose of an obvious fact that it can be put to some use, and then we can go on from there. Well, yes, we, we can say that uh, on the basis of obvious facts, we can learn things that are not obvious. By the visible things of this world, we can learn about the invisible things of the next, for example. And we can therefore look upon this world as a useful tool uh, as a way in which we can come to know things uh, that are not obvious. However, uh, obvious facts also may be looked at from the point of view of their very fruitfulness, because God created them. And they have about them not only the possibility of the means to an end but they have about them something of the quality, that is, something from something of the being of the end in itself, because they're creatures. Do you, do you understand the, the distinction? That is, you can look at a tree as a tree, as a thing, and it can be made use of as lumber, uh, and, uh, and, and and furthermore, it can, it can be. It, it, it can be uh, analyzed, uh, as a, and you can get all the way to the idea of substance, uh, uh, simply uh, uh, by examining a tree. But you also can look at a tree as a creature, 
That is, as a created thing. God created. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Now the heaven we don't know much about, but the earth is here before our very eyes. And when we consider the earth as a creature, when we consider things, not as things, but as creature, we move into this dimension of these things as having the quality, even beyond the quality, having the very being of God himself uh, in them. That is, they're emblems uh, of the being of God. But they have being, and God is being. That's that uh, that approach to that mystery of being that uh, that uh, Maritain was talking about. That purloined letter is a brilliant uh, metaphor, isn't it? God uh, is indeed a hidden God, isn't it? We can't see him, and yet he's everywhere. There's nothing closer to us <laughs> than God. Nothing really more obvious. I mean, God himself, uh, to push that God. metaphor to the, to the ultimate, God himself is a purloined letter. He's, he's hiding in the, in the obvious. And therefore, there is a, a kind of sacrilege uh, in this abuse of things. Not the proper use of them, but the abuse of them. That is, in that speed, that that hurrying on. Well, so much for the crescent moon. Now we'll go on to the full moon, or now we'll go on to the next thing that we want to learn. That is, we'll squeeze that moon dry like a, like a lemon and throw it away because now we have the juice, and the juice is in my notebook here. And it's, 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 it's the study. Now we can go on to bigger and better things. We can go on to the galaxies, you know, that are that are bigger and more the black more holes and, and everything and, else and, and more obscure, and, really. Yeah. Uh, Things that are that are less known uh, have a, have a kind of fascination uh, for us, uh, and and the smarter you are, the more uh, you have that sense of fascination. I don't I don't know whether we we, we have time because <laughs> here we are involved in speed. You know. That is, we, we, we even in, in a conversation such as ours today, we realize that there's a certain a certain number of feet in this tape that we're using here, and we have to go a little bit faster, but. Let's, let's at least get in a little bit to what Aristotle says here. I'm using a translation here in the Loeb Library Edition, which is one of the most easily accessible ones to students. Again, I'm not going to follow some kind of super scholarly text here, but just one that uh, an ordinary reader might read. Uh, this is from the, uh, the last book of the politics. The branches of study at present established fall into both classes, as was said before. Now, the both classes he's talking about are the useful things and the fruitful things. Now, let me repeat that again. The branches of study at present established. You know how Aristotle always proceeds from the given. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, uh, make up some kind of ideal education. He says, let's take a look at what people actually do in education. And he says, if you look at what people do, they fall into both of these classes. There are, perhaps, he says, four customary subjects of education. Reading and writing, gymnastics, music, and fourth, with some people, Drawing. Now you have to stop there and laugh. It was quite just laugh at that one because how how Aristotle does uh, uh, no rhetoric, doesn't he? Uh, uh, that is, he, he knows we're going to be absolutely explosive, explosive at that. You're going to divide all learning into reading, writing, gymnastics, uh, music, and draw, I mean, drawing <laughs> pictures. Is that is that? Part of the curriculum, well, indeed it is. But he does admit that it's only with some people, because that has that has this question. But but let's let's go on a little bit. Reading and writing and drawing being taught as being useful for the purpose of life and very serviceable. That is, you have to learn how to read and how to write in order to uh, open a can of beans 
or in order to write a letter to somebody, in order to get a job done, uh, you, uh, you, you have to know drawing uh, if you're going to build houses and make blueprints and, uh, and communicate uh, and go on with the advertising business. And gymnastics as contributing to manly courage. And it's gymnastic, uh, uh, which is not entirely to be identified with athletics, but something like it, uh, has to do with uh, 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 teaching uh, students to be uh, to learn how to bear uh, and to endure. If you if you go in for running a race, for example, you learn uh, how not to quit. You learn uh, the elements of courage. But as to music, here one might raise a question. For at present, most people take part in it for the sake of pleasure. But those who originally included it in education did so because, as has often been said, nature itself seeks to be able not only to engage rightly in business, but also to occupy leisure nobly. For to speak about it yet again, this is the first principle of all things. Now, we suddenly jumped up into a pretty serious study here. The first principle of all things. Why? Well, this distinction between business and leisure. Mr. S we quote the uh, passage in Mr. Senior's reading trans translation. It says, business and leisure uh, in the Greek. It says, really, literally, it says leisure and non-leisure. And the word for, uh, for, leisure, for leisure is, is skole. For which scholastic uh, derives. Which the word school and scholastic, scholastic itself <laughs> derives. That's, that's a very strange, leisure, yeah. it's a very strange thing. Yeah. It, it, uh, the Greeks, uh, really, the, the, the Greek word for what we call business, uh, which we think of as being the most important thing, business, as compared to leisure. Uh, the Greeks have a negative word. They say, ah, skole, not, not leisurely. Uh, that should suggest to you that, the, that somehow in the Greek mind there is something fundamental about the idea of leisure and something rather secondary about the matter of business. Business is for the sake of leisure. Yeah, that, that, that. that one of them is more more primary, more more fundamental, uh, more obvious than the other, and it's leisure. Uh, Skole is the is the more fundamental thing, and then there's the lack of it, which is business. Right. Or in in uh, in uh, in Latin we say negotium, which means business, and it's exactly the same thing. It means non idleness or non leisure. Negotium. It's kind of funny in this, in this very text that I'm reading from here. The editor, the, the modern editor, has marginal notes. Uh, this, they're useful. It says here in the margin the four normal studies. You know, and so when you're paging through the book, you can you can see that little note and then go across and read what Aristotle has to say about it. In other words, there's a method been applied here to Aristotle's text. But it's very funny down at the bottom of the page. You know what it says? The use of leisure. <laughs> you completely missed the point of, of what Aristotle was saying. That is the use of leisure. See, now Aristotle is going to tell us how useful leisure is. But the whole point is that, that leisure is not useful at all. Uh, that the useful is not uh, the leisure. And, and uh, we've got the whole thing turned around. I, I suppose the world always has. We in the United States tend to blame it on the Puritans. We, we blame it on the Protestant work ethic. Uh, but it's been around a lot longer than the Protestants. That is, uh, there, <clears throat> there is uh, a, a, uh, an unnatural tendency in man, we know, since the fall. Uh, and it is so uh, much of a tendency that what is unnatural by habit, and, and it's a habit of the human race, it's a habit we're born with, uh, by habit, it becomes second nature to us. 
uh, and therefore we think it's natural. Uh, and this, this, this thing that is natural to us is that the purpose of life is work. Uh, we are, uh, that is what we are. We are creatures of work. Uh, well, it has and that everything, therefore, you see, no matter what we do, everything that we do is ordered toward work. No, that is, uh, we confuse leisure with recreation. <coughs> Aristotle takes that up in a moment. He talks about play, and he says play has a certain use uh, in that uh, it's a form of rest. Uh, that is, uh, it goes along with sleep and uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, eating. And, uh, uh, that is, you do those things in order to be able to work. But, but what he means by scole, what he means by leisure here, is, is is not something useful for the purpose of getting back to work again. That is, we don't take Sunday off as a holiday in order that we can go back with a uh, with refreshed uh, bodies and minds on Monday. That's not the purpose of Sunday. No, Sunday is, uh, of course, the the Christian holiday of the week. Uh, it's the uh, it's the day of leisure. We're commanded by God uh, to do no work on Sunday, uh, to refrain from work on Sunday, because that is God's day. And uh, the reason why we work the other six days is so that we can afford to take that day off. Yeah. And since the fall, uh, we can't afford it seven days a week. Uh, so we have to we have to take it now. I don't know uh, about that. Uh, theologians would have to correct me. Do you suppose in the Garden of Eden that every day was sun? <laughs> yeah, that's been, that's been I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the, the, certainly, there was no. Uh, you see, the uh, the penalty that goes with work, that is the sweat of the brow, that is the, the, work, the labor. What we work is labor. it now is penal. There is there is a penalty attached to work, uh, and so it's it's onerous. It's, it serves as a burden, and uh, so it it uh, so we turn more readily uh, to. Uh, to play now as a diversion, simply to be free from the burden of work. And so we always see it in connection with work as just a way of being free. But the work, I mean, uh, Adam worked in the garden. He worked in another sense. He didn't labor, yeah. uh, but he worked. He did have a work. It was taking care of it. He was a gardener, as St. As Augustine says, he was a gardener. And he, uh, he worked. But there was no sweat of the brow. There was no labor involved in it at all. So that it, it was a, a kind of leisurely work, uh, if, uh, so to speak. It's interesting they were the combined. Word, the reason why I stress that word labor is that, again, in, 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 the, in words themselves, in the etymology, in the very history of the word itself, there, there's frequently a, a profound meaning. And, and labor is uh, connected with the, with the Latin word to fall. Uh, we well, you, you talk about lapse yeah. to the uh, and uh, uh, and the, the labor pains at childbirth. Uh, God says uh, that, that these are the these are two punishments. So death follows from sin, and labor follows. And labor means what? Uh, two things: uh, by the sweat of Adam's brow and by the pain of childbirth. And now Mary had no pain. She had no labor uh, in uh, the birth of Christ. Uh, and uh, I suppose Eve would have had no labor uh, in the bearing of children. Uh, and Adam would have had no labor in uh, taking care of the garden. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we, we uh, so we see that there, there, there is a, a moral dimension uh, and, and a mysterious dimension, a, a religious dimension to these ideas. Now Aristotle is not getting into all that. He's just simply, uh, from a purely natural point of view, uh, looking at these two things uh, in, in our lives. Uh, our lives are divided into uh, things we do because they lead to something else, and then there are things that we do because they are something else. 
We say we do them for their own sake, is another way of putting it. There are things that we do for the sake of something else, and there are things that we do for their own sake. He says, for if although both business and leisure are necessary, yet leisure is more desirable and more fully an end than business. We could translate business as work here. Uh, uh, we must inquire what is the proper occupation of leisure. For assuredly, it should not be employed in play, since it would follow that play would be the end of our lives. But if this is impossible, and sports should rather be employed in our times of business, for a man who is at work needs rest, and rest is the object of play, while business is accompanied by toil and exertion, it follows that in introducing sports, we must watch the right opportunity for their employment, since we are applying them to serve as a kind of medicine. For the activity of play is a relaxation of the soul, and serves as recreation because of its pleasantness. Now we can stop again. That's what we've been talking about. Play, in that sense, is not leisure, is it? See, I mean, we have here work and play as complementary. But now leisure is not in the order of either one. So that the, the athletic pursuit or the gymnastic pursuit, doing your exercises, why do you do them? Well, they're a kind of medicine for health. Uh, you see people out running every morning killing themselves out there that's not leisure even though they're not getting paid for it sometimes we, we identify our, our business as simply whatever we do for a living but we do a lot of other things for the sake of doing a living and among those things is recreation but, but that's not what, uh, what, what leisure is leisure Aristotle goes on leisure seems itself to contain pleasure and happiness and felicity of life. See, it's not a medicine. It's not something you do in order to be happy. It's happiness itself. It has the, the more of the nature of an end, as he said, uh, rather than a means to an end. And this, of course, happiness is the end of life. Uh, that's what we all desire is, is happiness. And this is not possessed by the busy, but by the leisure. For the busy man busies himself for the sake of some end, as not being in his possession. But happiness is an end already achieved, which all men think is accompanied by pleasure and not by pain. But all men do not go on to define this pleasure in the same way, but according to their various natures and to their own characters. And the pleasure with which the best man thinks that happiness is conjoined is the best pleasure in the one arising from the noblest sources, so that it is clear that some subjects must be learnt and acquired merely with a view to the pleasure in their pursuit, and that these studies, these branches of learning, are ends in themselves, while the forms of learning related to business are studied as necessary and as means to other things. Hence, our predecessors included music, in education, not as a necessity, for there is nothing necessary about music, nor as useful in the way in which reading and writing are useful for business and for household management and for acquiring learning and for many pursuits in civil life, while drawing also seems to be useful in making us better judges of the works of artists, for example. And he means by that, you know, architects and engineers and everything else. Nor yet again, as we pursue gymnastics for the sake of health and strength, for we do not see either of these things produced as the result of music. It remains, therefore, that it is useful, that is, music is useful, as a pastime in leisure, which is evidently the purpose for which people actually introduce it. For they rank it as a form of pastime that they think proper for free, that is, liberal, noble men. And for this reason, 
Homer wrote thus. <laughs> and of course he quotes music. Now music is used here in the wide sense to include uh, poetry. But him alone tis meet to summon to the festal banquet. And after these words, Homer speaks of certain others who call the bard that he may gladden all. And also in other verses, Odysseus says that this is the best of all pastimes when as men are enjoying good cheer, the banqueters seated in due order throughout the hall may hear the minstrel sing. Now that's this man's translation of Aristotle's quotation of some lines at, at the beginning of one of the books uh, of the Odyssey. How does that passage go? Well, the whole passage is, is at the beginning of, uh, of book nine. And uh, it's uh, Odysseus who's speaking. As Aristotle says, he says, this is at the point where Odysseus is going to begin to tell his story. He's in the palace of uh, King Alcinous, uh, and the king uh, implores Odysseus, uh, now that he knows who he is, he's discovered that he's Odysseus, and he, uh, he's having a feast, and he implores Odysseus to tell his story. And so uh, at that point, uh, not quite halfway through uh, the Odyssey, not uh, about a third of the way through the Odyssey, Odysseus begins to tell uh, the story of his adventures. Uh, but before he begins, he, he looks around him there in the banquet hall and he says uh, these lines that, uh, that Aristotle quoted from. I'm reading a different translation. This is, this is a prose uh, translation uh, by... Uh, uh, by E.B. Rue. Um, Odysseus says, Lord Alcinous, my most worshipful prince, it is indeed a lovely thing to hear a bard such as yours with a voice like the gods. I myself feel that there is nothing more delightful than when the festive mood reigns in a whole people's hearts and the banqueters listen to a minstrel from their seats in the hall while the tables before them are laden with bread and meat and a steward carries round the wine he has drawn from the bowl and fills their cups. And this, to my way of thinking, is something very like and then he goes on to tell his own his own tale. Now that's uh, that's a preliminary. <laughs> that's uh, that's a, it's a long. I think that's the kind of speech very often that people skip uh, when they when they're reading. They've been reading long in the Odyssey. They want to go off the outline. They say, "Well, let's get on to the story sure. here. We don't need all this. Uh, this that's a nice kind of." A, a polite gesture that Odysseus is making there, and he's always he's full of those polite gestures, which is absolutely true. Uh, but that's that's the most important thing. Well, that's uh, the one that Aristotle quotes. That's the one that Aristotle <laughs> chooses to quote. You know, uh, what what is the use of leisure? Uh, if, if Aristotle himself hadn't had the leisure to read Homer, uh, he never could have written this book called Politics. There is, in a paradoxical way, a kind of use to leisure. That is, that is, uh, you can quote Homer at the right moment, uh, but that's not the reason, of course, for reading it. It's a use to which he can be put, and it's a good use. It's a perfectly fine thing to do. But uh, the uh, the whole point that Aristotle is making here is that Homer is absolutely right about something, and again, that this is not philosophy. This is something before. This is this has to do with first principles, before philosophy gets going. These are the givens. If you don't have this to begin with, uh, then you can't go on to any kind of scholastic study. See, here they are uh, at this at the feast. It's, it's a feast. Uh, there has been dancing uh, at this feast. Uh, the, uh, uh, the bard has appeared 
the, the minstrel who comes in with a uh, and begins to uh, to strum on a harp, uh, and he is now going. He has he has chanted a, a song, and the song is about Troy. Uh, this is what led to the revelation of the identity of Odysseus. Uh, they don't know who Odysseus is. His host doesn't know that he is Odysseus. And uh, he, uh, the bard, comes in. And he's another purloined pearl, letter. There yeah. he is sitting right yeah. in front of them, yeah. and they don't know it. And they don't know. They're, 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 they're singing the song yeah. about Odysseus, and, and, but they don't know that he's there. And they, they, they sing this, uh, the bard sings the song, and Odysseus uh, breaks down and weeps at his song. He is so moved that he, he cries. He covers his face, and uh, then they say to him, they realize that they must have touched him something, to, they must have touched something very close to him, and so they ask him who he is, and he reveals his identity. Uh, but there they are in the midst of this, uh, this banquet, uh, and they're, uh, uh, they're celebrating, uh, they're eating and drinking, they are at leisure, we would say, and whenever you have leisure, uh, real leisure, uh, then one of the things that comes along is music, uh, or poetry. The word music includes uh, a great range of, of activities. Uh, and in this case, of course, now Odysseus is going to tell his story, and that's part of the celebration. You'd say, well, that's, he, that's his contribution uh, to the feast, and it's, uh, it makes up uh, the great central portion of this whole book. Uh, this this telling of the the tale of his own life about music. Aristotle says we have previously raised some questions in the course of our argument, but it is well to take them up again. <laughs> Notice that it is well to take them up again. Don't 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 be ashamed of of repeating and going back uh, to the beginning again and carry them further now in order that this may give the key, so to speak, for the principles which one might advance in pronouncing about it. For it is not easy to say precisely what potency music possesses. Lord Astor. <laughs> he said a mouthful, as we'd say. <laughs> uh, I, I was reading a book the other day uh, about the American poet uh, Edwin Arlington Robinson, uh, by uh, by another poet, Mark Van Doren, and uh, he uh, he quotes uh, Robinson. Robinson was asked once by a reporter, "What is poetry?" Uh, you know, reporters will always ask, well, "What is it that you do? What is your work?" Well, I'm a poet. Well, what is poetry? And and Edwin Arlington Robinson said, said, "It's uh, impossible to define, but." Uh, uh, Impossible uh, not to recognize. He has two words. What did he say? Something. I, you, you told me that the other day. Yeah, I, I missed it, didn't I? I missed, I missed the. Uh, in, he put it better than that. Yeah, it's. Uh, he, had, he, he got it down to about two words. He got it down to two words. It's unmistakable. Un he say? It's that's, unmistakable. that's it. That's it. He said uh, it, it's uh, un indefinable, indefinable but unmistakable. But unmistakable. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I put it in a strung out way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is, it's unmistakable. Anybody can recognize it. It's an obvious fact, isn't it, of our experience. That is, music is like, uh, is associated with, with the beautiful. And when you look at that crescent moon through the trees, or you look at that blue sky against that green tree, those green trees, you say, uh, it's unmistakable. But what is it? What, what are we talking about? Yeah, what, what people <laughs> say is, isn't that beautiful? And, and if you have... If, if someone says, well, yes, but, but what is that? What do you mean by saying it's beautiful? You say, well, but I, I can't explain. I can't explain what I mean by that. But isn't it so? And, and, the, and the reason why we can't is that we usually, our definitions usually are in terms of means related to end. That is, if someone says, well, what's, what's a knife? You say, well, a knife is a thing you cut bread with, and that defines it. But what is that sky? See, it, it's not a means to some end, and we can't define it, therefore, in terms of something else. We have to come to rest in it and see it 
Torah says. Well, Aristotle, you know, the, 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 Aristotle's has got a sense of humor. He, he's often thought of as a terribly sober fellow, but that's not true at all. Uh, that's, I really think, quite funny. Uh, it's not easy to say precisely what potency it possesses, nor yet for the sake of what object one should participate in it. Whether for amusement and relaxation, as one indulges in sleep and drinking, for these in themselves are not serious pursuits, but merely pleasant, and they relax our care, as Euripides says. Now he quotes another poem. Owing to which people actually class music with them and employ all of these things, sleep, deep drinking, and music in the same way. And they also place dancing in the same class. Now see, Aristotle is again following the obvious. This is what people do. John Keats has a long poem called Sleep and Poetry. There is something connected with dreams and, and sleep and, and rest that uh, has to do with music. Uh, we're not quite sure what that connection is, but people in general class them together, or with, with deep drinking, that is even with being drunk. Uh, poets uh, uh, go into a kind of drunkenness. Uh, there's a sort of uh, ecstasy about, about music. Uh, it seems to be, be, uh, be irrational. It, it, it's, uh, it's, like, it's like too much drink. It has about it some quality. Now, it isn't but it's something like those things, and, and dancing as well. Or, this is a long sentence, whether we ought rather to think that music tends in some degree to virtue. Now that shocks us. We've been talking about sleep. Sleep doesn't tend to virtue. Drink, uh, deep drinking, drunkenness uh, certainly doesn't. Uh, uh, but. There's something about music, on the other hand, it has another quality that tends in some degree to virtue. Music being capable of producing a certain quality of character, just as gymnastics are capable of producing a certain quality of body. Music accustoming men to be able to rejoice rightly. That's the line I, I wanted to stop on. I've got that one underlined. What is the purpose of music? Well, it doesn't have any purpose at all. It's an end in itself. What is it that it, it accomplishes? It, notice the word he uses here, the translator uses the word accustoms. He, he, he doesn't speak of teaching in a scholastic way, but teaching by habit. That is the word accustom, meaning repeating it over and over again until you can do it yourself. It's a kind of pointing, saying, well, look at the sky. Well, look at it again. Well, let's go back and, and notice it again. What, what the teacher of this kind does is he points and he takes the student and, and, and points the student at the thing and says, look at it, look at it, look at it, and, and gets him to do it over and over again. He accustoms him to it. That's a, that's a marvelous word. To what? To be able to rejoice rightly. Well, that's where the virtue comes in, isn't it? I mean, uh, rightly. Rightly. Rejoice that's rightly. Right. Because we know since sin came into our lives that we can rejoice wrong. And that was what we do. And again, uh, we were speaking about at the beginning of our hour here. He was speaking about obstacles to our course, uh, one of them being uh, method, uh, uh, another one being uh, uh, wrong, a wrong idea of, of authority, a kind of uh, dogmatism. Uh, and then we spoke of, of, of being in a hurry, of speed. And here uh, now uh, we, can, we, can, we can speak of a fourth. There there are uh, those who think that pleasure itself is sinful and that we shouldn't rejoice. Uh, that since this is a veil of tears, that we simply ought to be unhappy all the time. Uh, no, no, uh, to rejoice rightly. I, I just read 
I think it was just yesterday I read a passage I have never read before, although I think it's quite famous, and it, it was once attributed to St. Cyprian. Pro probably you know it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I guess it's uh, mistakenly attributed. It's called uh, the oh, There, there, go, those, <laughs> yeah, yeah. there, there yeah. go those methodical yeah, commentators uh, again. Uh, they always disturb you, but it's uh, De Spectaculus, it's, uh, it's called. It's a very short little treatise in which he, he attacks the, the sinful uh, uh, pleasures and especially the recreations of the day. Uh, the uh, all sorts of uh, lascivious and obscene spectacles, theatrical presentations, and, and so forth. And uh, he well, they, ends, they were the horrible uh, yeah. gladiators and all that. Yes, I mean, and he he, yeah. he he attacks it and warns Christians against participating in those in any way as being sinful and terrible things. And then he has the most marvelous passage on exactly what we've been talking about. He says, but. What we have, the spectacles, he says, that we have are the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees and the sky and, and all of those things that God has made. And we can, uh, we can uh, look at and admire those wonderful things. Uh, and, and that is our... That's our circus. Uh, that's, that's, that's our, our circus. circus. That's, that's right. right. That's, that is, uh, that's certainly a, a, uh, a right... Uh, enjoyment of, or rightly to rejoice in those things. Who, who was the Roman cynic who said, was it was it uh, Augustus, uh, who who said, you know, give them bread and circuses, yeah, uh, yeah, or someone I can't remember, uh, but it, but it's famous slogan. Well, all right, we have our bread and circuses. Yeah. Well, we have our we have our our Eucharist, and we have our creation. And this is the this is the Catholic life. Now, uh, they cannot be taken for granted. Aristotle is talking here about education. That is, there is a discipline of rejoicing because he he wouldn't put it this way. He would say there's something in our nature which leads us to rejoice warmly. We would say, well, we know what that is. That's original sin. It's in our members. And, and, and there is a rebellion. Uh, uh, so we have to have a discipline which gets us back on the right track. Uh, Adam didn't, didn't have to uh, study music. He didn't have to take a course in poetry. Adam didn't have to read Homer. But he could look right at the stars. He could look right at the lion and the tiger and, and sing. He, he, he could, uh, everything that he said was poetry. Everything that he uttered was music. Uh, Eve, uh, every, 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 uh, every one of her utterances was a song. They were, they were participating in a way in the, in the blessed life, you see. And uh, therefore, they they were rejoicing. That it, it, all of this reminds me of a very famous phrase in Saint Augustine. He defines the the blessed life, or some people say the happy life, uh, by saying that it consists of rejoicing. He says in the truth. He says, "Beata vita est gaudium de veritate." It's uh, re, it's gaudium. It's the rejoicing in things. Uh, that's that he says. That's the blessed life. That's the uh, that's the life of the blessed. That's what the uh, what the angels uh, and the uh, and those who have been saved do in heaven. But Adam did that in in his uh, in his own sphere in the Garden of Eden, and uh, we've lost that because we we do it wrong. Yeah. We rejoice all over the place, but we do it wrongly. And the, the Puritan. Uh, again, starts with a certain truth. That is, he looks at his own life and he looks at, at the world about him, uh, and he sees only the first half of Saint Cyprian's treatment. He sees only this horrid spectacle uh, that uh, Saint Paul says, "I have been made a spectacle to men." You know, he, he's on his way to, to martyrdom. That's what he's talking about. Uh, that is, those uh, those martyrdoms were circuses. People came to watch. Uh, as, a, as a form of, of poetry, as a form of entertainment. 
uh, they threw uh, they threw the, the martyrs to the lions and and, 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 the, and, the, and crucifixions and beheadings. And well, all in, in, in our own time, the uh, the we, we've seen the uh, the terrible perversion of uh, of storytelling and of music and of art. Well, and of rejoicing. Of sculpture, well, and of rejoicing itself, yeah. you see, and and everybody looks at those things and they say, look at all of the terrible things that are that are they're going on in what's called uh, with the uh, the entertainment industry, mm -hmm. and we say, well, it, it's all it's all terrible. What we ought to be doing, we ought to, we ought to shun all make, forms of uh, of make our lives a perpetual Lent. Somebody yeah. somebody in Shakespeare says that about <laughs> about the Puritan. He yeah. says that about. Uh, uh, the, the guy in Twelfth Night. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Malvolio. Malvolio. Uh, that's, a bad, good, that's a good Bad name. will. Yeah. Bad, bad will. And uh, someone says he, 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 he makes of, of his life a perpetual Lent. Well, of course we need Lent. Of, of course we have to uh, we have to do penance and, and we have to be sad. Uh, well, there's, there's nothing uh, more disgusting than people who are happy all the time either because we're not in heaven. And, 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 uh, and therefore, every day can't be a festival. Every, either. every day is not a feast, no. And every day, every day is not Sunday. And we have to work, and we have to sweat, and we have to labor, and we have to know pain, and we have to to face the truth uh, of pain. But we also, beyond that, and ultimately more important than that, uh, we do have to learn how to rejoice rightly. And that's the subject of, of of elementary education. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we we could do those four things? That is, if we could learn how to read and learn how to write, learn how to draw. I, I think in future hours we'll come back to some of these things. Uh, don't underestimate that drawing. Uh, our, just by parenthesis, Aristotle comes back to that. Oh, I'll never, I won't find the quotation, but he says that the um, the purpose of drawing is that it trains the senses to see what's there. Uh, that is, it, it, it sharpens your your wits and, and, and your your eye. Uh, uh, if you if you if you go to draw something that you look at, you really look at it, and, and therefore he says it's useful as a preliminary uh, to to music uh, to to the enjoyment of it. Because you can't enjoy it if you don't see it. Right, and you have to learn how to see. Uh, people think that well, all you have to do is open your eyes, and, and you will see. But that's not true. We have to learn everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been neglected, uh, very seriously neglected in our time. Uh, we know that through experience uh, that we have had with students that they they do not know how to see or to hear or to listen, and uh, it is only through the discipline of poetry uh, that or it is or music uh, that they must learn how to do that.